One of the subjects we study in pre-calculus is the idea of an inverse function. Let's review the idea of an inverse with this example. I have a function whose inputs and outputs are given by this table and I'm asked to evaluate f inverse of 4. So that's what this notation means with this superscript that looks like a power of minus 1 but it's not a power, it's not an exponent. When we're talking about functions this notation actually means inverse and what an inverse does is it reverses the role of inputs and outputs. So first of all if I w had been asked to evaluate f of 4 what would that mean? It would mean I plug in a 4 and I want to know what value I get out. Well according to the table if I plug in a 4 I should get out 12 f inverse of 4 switches this around. Instead of asking what happens when I plug in a 4, it asks me what number should I plug in in order to get out a 4. And so I can see that from the table because I get out a 4 when I plug in a 2. So we can see from this example what's going on with an inverse. It's switching the roles of inputs and outputs. Essentially it's asking us what number do we have to input to the original function f in order to get a desired output. So let's look at that example with a formula instead of a table same kind of question let's find f inverse of a so I want to know what do I have to plug in to my function f in order to get out an 8 I'm going to be plugging in some t value whatever I plug in for t is going to end up being computed with this expression 2t minus 4 to get the output and I want that output to be 8 Well, this is just an equation I can solve to figure out the value for t. If I add 4 to both sides, I get 2t equals 12. And then if I divide both sides by 12, I get t equals 6. So, f inverse of 8 is 6. And sure enough, I can check that by plugging 6 into the original function f. If I plug that in, I get 2 times 6 minus 4. That's 12 minus 4, which is indeed 8. So that's a check that I have computed the right answer. f inverse of 8 is 6. Sometimes we want to find a formula so that instead of asking for a specific output, I want to know the input that goes with a variable output. So if I want to get the value s out, what should I plug in for t? So in this case, the answer will depend on what s is. So we should expect a formula that depends on s. So now I'm plugging something into the function for t. And when I evaluate that function, I want to get s as a result. In order to figure out what to plug in for t, I just have to isolate t doing some algebra. So again, I will add 4 to both sides and then divide by 2. And this is telling me what t to plug in so that I'll get s as the output. So f inverse of s is the quantity we just computed, s plus 4 over 2. And as I mentioned earlier, it depends on this variable s. If I want to get the output s from my original function, this is the quantity I should plug in. So we can really think of the inverse as its own function. So you'll often be asked for the inverse function. That just means to do the same thing we did in the previous problem. So now I have a function f of x equals x over x plus 1. And I want to know 
what's f inverse of y. So what do I plug in for x if I want x over x plus 1 to give me y? So this example is going to involve slightly trickier algebra, but let's see how it works out. First of all, I want to isolate x. So I'm going to have to clear the fraction here. I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by the denominator x plus 1. So if I do that, x plus 1 cancels on the left side, and on the right side I get y times x plus 1. And then I can get rid of those parentheses by multiplying y times x plus y if I distribute this y. Now remember, my goal was to isolate x. So let's get x on just one side of the equation. First of all, I can subtract y times x from both sides. And then from each of these terms, I can factor out an x. And then finally, there's only one more step in order to isolate x. I divide both sides by 1 minus y. So f inverse of y is this function, y over 1 minus y. This is a typical set of steps that you might have to go through when you're finding the inverse of a rational function. Remember this trick. Remember to clear your fractions and then distribute to get rid of parentheses. Then get all the variables you're trying to isolate on the same side of the equation so that you're able to factor out the variable you're trying to isolate. Here's another example of calculating the inverse function. So I want to know how to get an output of v in order to calculate f inverse of v. So the first thing I can do is divide both sides by 2. Now, in order to isolate the u here, I'm going to have to undo the exponentiation e to the u, which means I actually have to use the inverse of the exponentiation function, and that's the natural logarithm function. So I take natural log of e to the u. I actually have to do that to both sides. Take natural log of both sides. And the point is natural log of e to the u simplifies to just u. That's one of the properties of logarithms and exponentials, the way that simplifies. That was the whole reason for using a natural logarithm. Now I've isolated the u. And so that's telling me what u I plug in to get an output of v. So f inverse of v is this function, natural log of v over 2. Let's look at another example. Let's find a formula for the inverse function of 3 plus natural log of x. So this example is a little bit different than the previous one because notice that my output variable is being written with the same symbol that I'm using for the input variable. And so you might be tempted to try to write 3 plus natural log of x equals x. But don't do that. That's going to get you into trouble. We have to solve this problem the same way we did before. We're going to have to introduce a temporary variable in order to isolate the x. The problem is I'm right now I'm using the same symbol x to represent two different things, an input and an output. And I can't do that. That's going to cause confusion. So I need to temporarily use a different symbol to represent the output variable. So let's find f inverse of something else. I'm just going to use a y, but I'm free to pick pretty much any symbol I want other than x. So we'll start by solving this problem, and then we'll see how to patch it up to get what we were originally asked for. So f inverse of y, we solve the same way we did the previous example, 3 plus natural log of x equals y, and isolate the x. So I will subtract 3 from both sides, and then I need to undo the natural logarithm. And just like 
the natural logarithm undoes exponentiation, exponentiation undoes the natural logarithm. So e to the natural log of x should be equal to e to the y minus 3. Exponentiate both sides like this. The point being that the left side simplifies to just x. We've isolated the x, and so the right side is a formula for f inverse of y. Now that we've got a formula for f inverse of y, I can replace that y with any variable I want. In particular, I could replace it with an x to get a formula for the function f inverse of x. So remember this, if you're asked to find a formula for f inverse and the problem is using the same symbol to represent the input for the inverse as it does the input for the original function, you should temporarily use a different variable. Temporarily find f inverse of something else so that you avoid confusion between the input and the output variables of f. After you're done doing that, you can replace your temporary variable with whatever you need. Now why would you ever want to do this? Why would you want to write both f and f inverse with the same symbol representing their inputs? Well that might be so that you could graph those two functions on the same xy plane so you'd need both of them to have the same input variable in order to graph them both on the same coordinate axes. So for example Here's a function, and here's the graph of the inverse of that function. Now you'll notice that there's some symmetry here, and it turns out that the graphs are related. The graph of the function and the graph of the inverse are reflections of each other across this line y equals x. That's always the case. If one of these is f and the other one is f inverse, they will always be symmetric around this line y equals x. That's part of what you get when you graph f of x and f inverse of x on the same coordinate plane.